You're listening to the BBM Global Network with 25 years in broadcast audio and video production. Our passionate team creates content and marketing for the world of Internet talk radio. If you've got a passion, come join us at bbmglobalnetwork.com. The BBM Global Network. Your voice is now heard. This is Living Without Lies with your host, Donna Warren. You're not alone if you've been the victim of abuse, drug usage, or rape. Living Without Lies is here to help. Listen as Donna Warren assists women across the country break the cycle and help create a new life. So now, please welcome the host of Living Without Lies, Donna Warren. folks. Welcome to the Living Without Lies program. I'm your host, Donna Warren. We're coming to you live from BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. And again, I have uh, a guest tonight, Denise uh, Clare, who's been with us for the last several shows and uh, will probably be on many more. Uh, Denise, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing great, and I'm just very glad to be here. Oh, Good. I'm not sure what special, but okay. <laughs> I'll take your word for it. <laughs> okay. And, uh, you know, tonight, folks, we're, we're planning to talk about the differences between men and women, some of the differences, because contrary to the some of the garbage I hear from the super left liberals, there are differences between men and women. Some of them are culture. Some of them are biological. But there are differences, and they make a difference in how we relate to each other. And when you get into the problems, you know, we talk a lot about uh, homelessness, abuse, and all of these. When we get into these situations, they're even more pronounced than they are necessarily in everyday life. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. You know, part of uh, the differences, uh, our differences are, uh, you know, genetic and they're biological, but I think most of the rest of the differences in between the sexes is that are cultural. Are cultural. The biological ones are things that normal adult women and men are hardwired to protect children. That's a higher. Uh, that's that's a survival trait. It's part of our survival instinct. And that is the thing, you know, in in the more primitive societies in this world, and there's quite a few of them still out there. You know, the men protect the women. They're the first line of defense if, you know, a group, uh, say, MS-13 is a good example. If MS-13 gang comes into your town, the men are the first line of defense. You know, the young boys are the next line of defense. You know, the uh, 11 to 15-year-olds. Then the grown women are the, the next line of defense, all of which are protecting the children. And with the children will be the old people who are too old to be out there on those first lines of defense. And that's a biological thing. That's not cultural. That's biological. So if we're wired correctly, we do we do, do that. But, when, but the rest, most of the rest of it has to do with sexuality and also with culture. Now – Denise, do you think uh, think about it? At between the birth and the age of five, do we really raise our girls and boys differently? What do you think? Uh, I'm. I think they're not near as much as when they get a little bit older. Uh, but uh, I also wanted to say that that men's brains or boys' brains and girls' brains uh, are actually physically different and so a lot of people don't realize that that their brains are actually made differently and because of that uh, of course we're going to see things differently and and compute things differently so that has something to do with it too Um, but I I think that uh, probably for the most part part, uh, uh, girls and boys uh, you know are not as uh, 
uh, differentiated between, I don't know, when I was growing up, I think it was a lot more so maybe than today, uh, but uh, 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 probably now people are a little bit more open to allowing a child to um, express themselves in in the way they want to express themselves. Uh, you you may know more about that than I do, so uh, I I really would like to hear what you have to say too. Okay. Well, between the ages of birth and five years old, we don't, from a cultural point of view, uh, as Americans, we don't pressure our children to be different in the way they interact with the rest of the world. Uh, some cultures are more more inclined to do so and may do it a little younger, but usually they don't. In other words, we don't tell a three-year-old boy that falls and skins his knees. We don't punish him for crying because he got hurt. We comfort him and we let him cry. The same thing, we don't, you know, we don't punish a, a girl differently than a boy when they throw a temper tantrum and don't want to go to work. I mean, go to bed. We, uh, you know, we will treat them both. No, we may discipline them in different ways, but we'll treat them the same way. The three-year-old boy won't be disciplined differently than that three-year-old girl, you know. And this is, we don't do that much to them when they're little, when they're that young. So they're both allowed to do these things. Boys can cry. Boys can get upset. They can both throw temper tantrums, etc. at that age. I don't see the difference starting until they start school usually. It's kindergarten, which will put them somewhere between 5 and 7, depending where they live and when their birthdays are. It starts to be a difference in how we socialize them when they reach that age. Um, boys are more likely to be told, if nothing else, they'll get made fun of in school. But they'll be, if not by their own peers, but by older kids. But boys are, are, are starting, this is when they start discouraging them from crying every time they skin their knee. This is when we start discouraging them from crying every time they, you know, they don't get what they want. They'll still throw temper tantrums, but most of the time, most parents will actually discipline them and punish them for throwing a temper tantrum. When they're little, we just, you know, a kid doesn't want to go to bed, you pick them up and you go put them in the bed and put them there and let them cry if they scream and carry on if they want to. And you just ignore them at that point. But when they get older, you don't tolerate that from them. That's when you begin to punish them for doing that. So what do you think? Uh, I, like I said, I mean, I don't really know what the parenting uh, is of kids today. Uh, I think that was pretty much true uh, for me uh, when I was raising my son and um, most uh, parents back then. Uh, although I do know that... Um, I mean, as a little girl, I had a lot of uh, dolls, uh, probably even before uh, I went to school. Um, and, and, I mean, I liked cowboys, uh, and uh, like Gene Autry, and I and, uh, was a Lone Ranger, and so many. I mean, back then, that was really big, and so I liked that, too, and my parents never did discourage me from, you know, playing with uh, with action, you know, with figures that had to do with uh, being cowboys or Indians or something like that. So uh, I, I really don't know how the rest of, uh, of uh, my friends, uh, I, I, it probably was pretty much the same, but that's what I remember. Well, I know when I was young, I, I'd like to play... You know, with uh, toys. And, and yes, even back then and today, too, we're much more likely to buy a princess outfit for a daughter, you know, uh, a superhero outfit for a boy. But we might buy them for both. We may encourage our boys into things that later in life will be considered more manly and our girls into things that later in life are considered more womanly. But we're not usually punish them if they're interested in the other ones. You know, years ago boys would have been published when I was a kid that boys would have been punished for playing with dolls so what did they do the whole industry came into being called action figures you know toy soldiers superheroes in other words dolls that boys were allowed to play with and uh, you know they there was they did that all of the kids learned when I was growing up learned to ride bicycles we might not have a bike but we learned how to ride them and we also would go play in the water 
and all of those other things. But uh, up until school, I didn't see a whole lot. And even with my children, I have grandchildren. I have great-grandchildren. I don't see a lot of difference in that going on right now, even with what the things are parenting today. Now, I don't know any of the millennial snowflakes and the super left. I don't know how they're raising their children. They may be doing something very differently. I don't know because I don't know anybody like that. And even though my daughter-in-law is a cop, she's never said anything about them doing anything very different. So it doesn't seem to have changed all that much. You know, part of dealing with kids is, is being able to live in the house with them, you know, and not let them hurt themselves or let them interfere or destroy anything in the house. So um, that's the best I can say on that part. And uh, I just got the notice we're supposed to go to a commercial. So uh, if you have want to leave us any comments on the blog, lo log in on the BBM, BBM Network blog and leave us a comment. Or you can call at 866-451-1451 or you can text me at 732-995-3969. And we'll be back in a couple. Do you ever wonder why certain things are happening in your life? How to start a business or a new direction? Need answers? Astrologer Bonnie Perbula can help you reveal your true self and gain strength and focus so you can achieve greater joy and success. Working with a natal birth date, time, and location, Bonnie brings out qualities to aid you in getting the best from your life. She can help you unlock dormant traits to bring you greater awareness. Bonnie also conducts public speaking engagements to educate aspiring astrologers on their journey to the stars. A gifted artist bonnie bridges her talents and recently launched a line of astro bears uniquely created in colors of individuals astrology charts she also makes one-of-a-kind necklaces of crystal beads and woven thread to learn more about the world of bonnie perbula go to bonniegperbula.com and for astrology consulting visit astrologyconsultants.com or call or email her at 808-526-1536 or bonniegp at aol.com Do you ever wonder why certain things are happening in your life? How to start a business or a new direction? Need answers? Astrologer Bonnie Perbula can help you reveal your true self and gain strength and focus so you can achieve greater joy and success. Working with a natal birth date, time, and location, Bonnie brings out qualities to aid you in getting the best from your life. She can help you unlock dormant traits to bring you greater awareness. Bonnie also conducts public speaking engagements to educate aspiring astrologers on their journey to the stars. A gifted artist Bonnie bridges her talents and recently launched a line of astro bears uniquely created in colors of individuals astrology charts she also makes one-of-a-kind necklaces of crystal beads and woven thread to learn more about the world of Bonnie Perbula go to bonniegperbula.com and for astrology consulting visit astrologyconsultants.com or call or email her at 808-526-1536 or bonniegp at aol.com Hi, folks. Welcome back. Come back from the uh, commercials. And before that, we were talking about dealing with young children. Now, some of the other differences that we see in children is in our middle-aged children from 7 to puberty, which can be anywhere from 10 to 13 or 14, depending on partly on your ethnic background. That's a biological thing. Um, Latino women go through, uh, they start their periods younger than uh, some of the uh, people from northern Europe and colder climates. But until we hit that that level, with most kids, we are now putting in, culturally we're putting them in the thing, the young boys are being groomed to be men, which means they have to learn not to cry when they get hurt. They have to learn how to man up, you know, how to get up and shake it off and go do it again. Uh, it isn't okay for them to cry every time they don't get something they want. You know, it's not okay to do that. Yet for girls, all that stuff is still okay. Girls can cry all they want to. You know, all of the children at that age are usually taught not to throw temper tantrums uh, because most people, parents just won't put up with that nonsense from them. And they're given more and more responsibility. Most of us give our children chores. And the chores are different for the boys and the girls in most cases. Uh, most of the time we give the what are considered the woman's job in the home we give that to the girls to do and what we consider the man's jobs we give to our boys which means girls will wash dishes and do laundry boys will cut grass and sweep walkways and shovel snow and do stuff like that how about you has that been your experience too Dee? 
Yeah, I, I found that to be the same, too. Uh, I also was thinking about uh, uh, some of the things that boys and girls are taught and how it's a little bit different. Uh, boys uh, are, are usually taught that, that their value has to do with being uh, a good provider and a problem solver and, uh, and, and being different, uh, there being a hierarchy uh, in in the um, in, in the group of, of boys, uh, and later on in manhood, uh, and and girls are are more for um, for um, uh, intimacy. Uh, they're, they're more for uh, uh, they they differentiate um, by their looks and their connectionness with others, uh, being more the same where. Where guys are more into uh, being different, uh, so that, that's something that um, you know that I have been thinking about also. All right. Again, uh, I raised two sons, so I can tell you all about boys. I have a granddaughter. I learned all about raising grand, you know, girls with her. And there are differences in them. Boys are more physically aggressive. They're uh, much more likely to do dangerous things than girls are. That doesn't mean there aren't girls that do it, because some do. But for the most part, <clears throat> girls are like that. My third husband and I are good examples of the way that children were, you know, uh, are taught to be a boy or a girl. My third husband liked to cook. Well, he nobody gave him a hard time when he was six or seven, but as he got older, they started giving him a hard time about liking to cook. And, uh, you know, uh, he got things like, well, men don't cook. You can't be a man doing that. That's a woman's job. You know, and I, he, I remember him telling me, you know, that really bothered him because he just liked to do it. It didn't seem to him that all that big a deal, which is something he enjoyed doing. And I had the same problem. Now, I was a girl who liked math and science. I liked to build things. I also liked, as I got a little older, I liked to blow them up, too. I liked to blow things up. And I enjoyed that sort of thing. Now, fortunately, I had a father who told me that most people would think something was wrong with me as a girl because I liked that sort of thing. But he bought me a soldering iron for my eighth birthday. His hobby was electronics, and he let me, he shared his hobby with me. So he didn't discourage me from doing, but he did warn me that other people would. And we were, you know, go differently. Um, I never cared much for playing with dolls until they said that, uh, you know, that's I started finding the dolls that you could put batteries in and, you know, things were, you know, what happens with a girl? What do we give the boys? We give them action figures with tanks and trucks and remote control trucks. What do we give our girls? They still play with trucks or cars, but they're called Barbie cars. And some of them are remote control, too, and we drive them around and do it. But, you know, the emphasis is on girls, like the feminine things, the things that pertain to the house and emotions and babies and cleaning and all that stuff. And boys like the more dangerous outdoor stuff. And uh, that's where the differentiation really starts at that age. And, uh, it, you know, it produces until it gets older. And we don't really see a real push on it until puberty. And then everything changes. What do you think, Dee? Well, I, I agree with you totally. And uh, I know, well, personally, I, I was interested in dolls. And, and I know back then, kids played outside. They did a lot of things together. They, they, they just uh, had a lot of fun and did things outdoors enjoyed each other uh but um uh, i was i was into uh ballet and and toe and tap and and as i got older i i always liked horses so we have to go to uh, a commercial day i'm going to have to interrupt you so uh oh, that's people, great. We, we go to commercial i apologize but we have to and uh you know call us at uh, 866-451-1451 Leave a comment on the blog or text me at 732-995-39. Next time, be back in a few. Animal lover, author, artist, and public speaker, Patricia Daly Life is a renaissance woman in her own right. A lover of animals from a young age, Patricia lives on a farm in Virginia and has rescued neglected thoroughbred horses, keeping them or finding them safe havens. 
She is also a published author, and her books document real-life experiences that she shares in her passionate stories, taking the reader around the world in a colorful kaleidoscope of life. An accomplished artist, Patricia Daly Life's oil paintings feature animals, portraits, stills, nature, and abstract, and she allows the brush to paint the image in an organic, natural way. A public speaker, Patricia is motivated to continually wonder about life and advocates for all of us to do the same and document our own unique history. To learn more about Patricia Daly Life, visit www.literarylady.com and www.patricialife.com or email her at pdlife at gmail.com. Hello, I'm Steve Fagan, and I'm president and CEO of Fagan Associates, but I'm also a life coach. I'm here to help you reach your dreams, goals, and objectives. As a life coach, it's my job to be your support, to be your teammate, to help you understand what is your dream, what is your life passion, and then together we work as that team to help you reach your specific goals. Life is worth living the best you can be. Working with a life coach, you're fulfilling those dreams and goals is your passion, and it's your way of living. Let me help you do that today. Let me help you really reach the best that you can be as a person and live the life you should be living. I'm Steve Fagan. I'm a life coach, and I'm here for you. Contact Steve Fagan at FaganAndAssociatesInc.com or call 1-800-239-2701. And I'll be glad to help you move forward to live the life of success. Reach your dreams, your goals, your objectives. We can do it together. Hi, folks. Welcome back. We were talking about uh, Thanksgiving pies during the break. So all of you that are wanting pie for Thanksgiving, it's a good thing to think about. All right. Now we were talking about, uh, and why are we talking about these differences? Uh, One of the reasons we are is because the purpose of our foundation and is to help people fix things when they're having problems. And their problems are usually end up in things like drug and alcohol abuse, uh, homelessness, you know, and all things of these natures. And both men and women get into these problems, but they they react differently to them. And they and although the policies and the principles of fixing them are the same, they work differently with men and women. You know, everything of fixing your life requires brutal honesty with yourself. But what's important to you is partly gender based. For example, once they do hit puberty Girls are mostly oh now both male boys and girls are competitive with each with each other. Girls are mostly interested in how pretty they are, how nice they look, how good their figure is, whether boys like them. They're interested in fashion and all of this thing. Most girls are, not all, but the majority of them are. And this is one of the ways women determine part of their a good chunk of their self worth is determined by whether men find them attractive. Boys, on the other hand, are much more competitive with each other. They're much more likely to try to, you know, one-up the other one to be better, to be the best athlete, to be this, that. They're much more likely to do that, and they're very competitive with each other. But, uh, you know, and they look at their self-worth, they build that. So something that I know most men and women don't seem to understand. Women determine whether their womanhood by whether men find them attractive. Men, on the other hand, determine their manhood by what other men think of them, which is why they have so much trouble talking to each other about that particular topic. Because for the most part, ladies, you might not like it, but your man doesn't really care much what women think about him. He should, it doesn't affect his manhood. He might care for other reasons, but not for his manhood. And guys, she don't care what the other women think about her. For her, for her basic woman, woman and self worth as a woman, men determine her self worth by how they react to her, and that can be a, an interesting problem when they start communicating, and that different uh, outlook makes a big difference in how they react. What do you think, Dee? Well, I agree with you, and I was really surprised we had been talking about this uh, before the show, and I really wasn't aware of that. Uh, but now that you've brought it out, it really does make perfect sense. And, uh, you know, so when you're thinking about how uh, conversations and things play out, uh, as you notice these things that, that we're bringing out, uh, you can kind of analyze them and say, oh, well, that's why. 
you know, this happened, and that's why that happened. And and so it really helps us to be able to um, understand and cope with things better and maybe find better ways of of, of relating. Yeah, and, and also, you know, part of the problem and what we see is, well, what, you know, our society comes with us. Now, in our society, you know, I think one of the best, uh, and I think even most of the young people have seen some of this man's movies, was John Wayne. You know, the cowboy and the military guy. He was the strong, tough, somewhat silent male who protected everybody, wouldn't take bullshit from anybody, you know, but was kind and gentle and loving. You know, this was what our society referred to as a man's man. You know, something that most men aspire to being. And one of the problems that I see in our society today is part of it, depending on which part of our society you're in, the, the far left and the progressives seem to want men to be wussies, not to be that way, not to be aggressive and physical. Um, in our lower class neighborhoods and among those folks, you know, we're looking at the thug as manhood. A lot of young men are out there in those neighborhoods shooting people to prove their manhood. And this is a lot of what's going wrong in our society today is the values aren't there. And But it's just as important to a man today to prove his manhood as it was 50 years ago. And for the same thing with women. And if we understand where we're going and why we're that way, it's a lot easier to work with it. But uh, we have to define, and this is why in our the Living with Allies program, we go into what do you believe? What are your true beliefs? Because your belief about your self-worth is in a large part determined by how you see yourself as a man or how you see yourself as a woman. That's a good – it's not all of our self-worth by any means, but it is a big part of it. And when we go to fixing things, we have to look at that. We can't ignore that. You can't ignore those things. And no matter how much society tells us we should do, and for those people who aren't uh, binary, fine. You know, but these these physical and things are still there. They don't go away. I have, I'm a motorcycle rider. I've been in a motorcycle club for 20 years, and we have a couple of lesbian cu- cu- couples in that club. And from what I've seen, just knowing them for 20 some years now, is they have all the same problems that uh, heterosexuals have in their relationships. And they have less communication issues on the manhood and womanhood issue because they're looking at it from the same point of view. But, uh, you know, we, we these are important things, and it's important to, to go with a woman. Now, a man that's been in jail and been in trouble and all of this, isn't he doesn't necessarily lose any of his manhood. And in some parts of our society, he's actually revered as being more of a man. However, women that end up in jail, go to prisons, or alcoholics, drug addicts, prostitutes, they're looked down on as trash, garbage, you know, not worth anything in our society. And so for a man to come back from that kind of background and past, he has an easier time in one sense of coming back and a harder in another sense because what he believes about what is a man determines how he's going to feel about himself. And then all the other beliefs we have about ourselves are affecting this. And like I said, the principles are the same. To fix your life, you have to be brutally honest with yourself. You have to accept your part in everything that happens to you. You know, in most cases, we play a part in it. You know, if I may, if I happen to get in my car and drive down the street and I'm driving down the road and a tractor trailer runs a red light and it hits me, did I do anything wrong? No, but I put myself in that location. I was in the wrong place at the wrong time, but I'm the one that got in the car and drove to that location. The only way I'm totally not responsible and played no part in anything is if I'm asleep in my bed, and I know someone this happened to several years ago, a plane hit their house. And the parents in that family were killed. They were asleep. A couple of the kids were teenagers. They were sitting in the in the living room watching TV. They didn't get hit by the plane, but their parents did. That's one time they did absolutely nothing. They were in the wrong place at the wrong time, but they were in – the normal, the place where they normally were. They weren't in an unusual place. But when we have to accept when we do something, our role in everything that happens to us, because we do play some part. 
and it's hard. We have to decide what we want to be. It's hard for young young women. I remember when my boys were in their early teens, you know, that just that puberty area. Um, they were worried about whether anyone would like us, like them. They were worried about whether they were going to be good men. They were worried about all of those things. Now we have to go to commercial again. So uh, give us a holler at 866-451-1451. Leave a comment on the blog or text me at 732-995-3969. Back in a few. Patricia Fayweather Harlow is passionate about the environment and conserving our natural resources. She's written a five-part book series for all ages called Rock with Rodney and Party with Perky to Preserve Wildlife, which brings awareness through these vibrant characters on preserving and protecting our national parks and historic landmarks. Harlow has launched a campaign to mobilize green supporters, informing a united front against big oil, big coal, and the Keystone XL pipeline. And she addresses the controversial practice of fracking in books four and five. She's determined to bring greater awareness to the dangers of drilling and running crude oil through pipelines that cut through pristine landscapes. And she empowers readers to take action in keeping America beautiful. To learn more about Patricia Fayweather Harlow and to purchase her books, visit www.patricia-fayweather-harlow.com. That's F-A-Y-E-R-W-E-A-T-H-E-R. And play your part in preserving the landscape that we all share and love. Hi, my name is Myra Fox, and I am a survivor. I am the founder of the Castle Lewis I Survived Foundation and the author of a series of books entitled I Survived a Murder Untold, which tells the story of my sister and I who were abandoned and left in the care of a woman who beat us repeatedly. Unfortunately, it resulted in the death of my sister, Castle Lewis, which is revealed in a page-to-page chilling story. After spending time in the foster care system, I've documented my suffering and my loss and ultimately my survival. I'm blessed to work daily in my community and surrounding areas to give back by helping others and feeding the homeless. I want to spread awareness of the dangers of abuse. You can purchase my books and contribute to the Castle Lewis I Survive Foundation by visiting www.castlelewis.com or you can call us at 540-999-8401. Thank you. Welcome back, folks, here. Before the break, we were, I was talking about uh, men and women and how it's difficult for us and how we have to accept our responsibility and everything that happens to us in order to fix our problems. Because isn't the goal to be happy? And what does happy mean? Well, um, I was listening to something uh, on uh, Prager University with Dennis Prager today. And he was talking about how people that are grateful are usually happy, but ungrateful people are never happy. They never get enough. That is all part of our belief system. But we, as men and women, that's part of it. And it's very difficult to come back. We have to find out why we feel the way we do, what we believe, because I have found in my life, and men, those of you that have been listening over time know that my background is anything but average, normal, or good. And, uh, you know, and I found that for me to be happy, I have to live by my true beliefs. And I had to be honest with myself to figure out what they are. Now, as we're going, you know, through things uh, in relationships, that can be a hard thing. And But, you know, in our society, we are taught that, you know, uh, well, you'll hear it out that women are nothing unless they have a man. Uh, men are not taught that, you know, but most men are told having a good woman standing behind them is will make their life easier. But, uh, you know, our relationships can be a source of great pleasure. They can be a source of, you know, uh, great pain. And in order to, you know, and the thing is, one of our basic drives is to reproduce. You know, and if we have children, we need to raise them. And we want to, I don't know about what everybody else wanted for their children, but I wanted my children, my goal for my kids was that they grow up to be independent, self-supporting, contributing members of society. You know, that was my total goal for them. You know, preferably they would be self-supporting by legal means. That was the preference. But, uh, you know, that they'd be independent, self-supporting, contributing members of society. Now, I'm very fortunate both of my sons grew up to be that. They exceeded my expectations by a lot, you know, and they both are very good, decent men. 
What do you think, Kate? Well, I, I I feel pretty much the same way, and uh, I know there are parents that uh, already have preconceived ideas of what they want their children to be, and oftentimes they uh, pressure them uh, to uh, to a certain uh, profession or something like that. Uh, uh, lots of times, parents will live uh, their lives, and sometimes lives that were unfulfilled by themselves, uh, uh, so that they can just kind of uh, vicariously uh, live through their kids as they as they become what they had hoped that they would become. But generally, that really isn't uh, something that maybe the child secretly, as they've grown up. You know, they may have wanted it to be something else. And, uh, of course, that can color the relationships. It can color everything. And uh, I was like you. I I wanted uh, my, my son to – I didn't have anything in particular that I really wanted him to be. I just wanted him to be healthy and happy and, and responsible and, and become, you know, the best at whatever he wanted to be or, or, or do. And he turned out very well. And so uh, – uh, I feel the same. Yeah, and one of the things that, you know, as we're growing up, uh, the things we're taught as children have a lot of effect on us later in life, but so does the opinions of other children. That is a bigger problem with boys because boys find that sense of self-worth, their sense of manhood, their sense of masculinity. They get that from what other males think of them. And uh, that's one reason they're as competitive with each other as they are. Uh, females, again, are looking toward how whether the males like them as to putting some of their self-worth. But beyond that, that, that's a biological thing. The rest of our self-worth comes from being told that, you know, you know, I don't, you know, I was told I was a waste of oxygen when I was growing up. I couldn't talk. I, I had a hearing problem. I couldn't talk clearly. Like very few people could understand me. And, uh, you know, this was a big problem for me. I was a freak, an outcast. And, uh, you know, uh, unfortunately, my mother was the type of person who, as what Dee was just saying, you know, when I did something wrong or was, you know, not good at something or in this case had a physical problem, uh, she took it as a, a reflection on her not being a good mother. And she made my life miserable, and she's the one who convinced me I wasn't, I was waste, you know, a waste of oxygen. And for a child to think that, that makes it tough. You start looking around to find a way to find a really to find somewhere where you fit in. I didn't. Uh, I grew up in a poor neighborhood. I grew up uh, poor. We didn't have much. Uh, I didn't seem to be able to get along with all the good kids in school since I was a bad one. I was in trouble. I got expelled four times when I was in school, and first time in the sixth grade. And, uh, you know, I, I finally fell in with the bad crowd, the crowd that would accept me where I could feel like I belonged. And I was in trouble my whole, uh, most of my life until I was in my mid-20s. I was in trouble. As I tell people, my first career was as a criminal, and I was actually very good at it. I only got caught a couple times. And I took pride in the fact that I didn't get caught very often. And this type of thing. And is that a normal background for most children? No. But I proved to myself that I was good at something. That's where self-confidence comes from. I proved to myself that I was good at something. I might not be able, I mean, I, I might not be able to speak clearly, but I was good at something. And, you know, so that, that all matters. We come back. We'll talk some more about it. We have to go for another commercial. Um, you know, please call if you want at uh, 866-451-1451. Uh, you can uh, leave a comment on the blog on the radio station. And you can text me at 732-995-3969. And we'll be back in a few. Are you stressed? Is your stress driving you crazy? Do you know there are many ways to relieve the stress? The Spirit Within Massage and Hypnosis Clinic does just that. Reduce your stress plus so much more. Established in 1997, the Spirit Within Massage and Hypnosis Clinic offers an approach to wellness. 
For those individuals who choose to either utilize appropriate complementary methods to enhance their current medical care, or to those individuals who are on their personal journey toward improved health and wellness through the use of therapeutic bodywork, Reiki energy healing, or hypnosis. The Spirit Within Massage and Hypnosis Clinic is owned by Dr. Judy Dean, a registered nurse and board-certified massage therapist and medical hypnotherapist in LaPorte, Indiana. Visit www.spiritwithinmassage-hypnosis.com to see all services offered by Dr. Judy. For a free personal consultation, please call Dr. Judy Dean at 219-326-1380. The Spirit Within Massage and Hypnosis Clinic, 219-326-1380. Escape from Hell, A Woman's Story is a passionate book that tells the true story of author Rhonda Knutson's journey through the darkness and adversity of abuse. The book takes readers on an emotional trail from the depths of despair to the heights of forgiveness and understanding. She was inspired to help others, and her book is a vital tool through this process. Faithful to God and devotional to her beacon of hope, Rhonda Knutson is a perfect example of finding a guiding light that helped her come through the dark and into the light. Her book can assist you in overcoming your challenges with abuse. The publication of Escape from Hell, A Woman's Story is a triumphant achievement, and it can help you take ownership of your own experience of abuse and come through stronger than before. Rhonda is currently working on two more books, Shadows of Corruption and Coast to Coast on a Piece of Toast. To read more about this inspiring author and purchase her books, visit RhondaKnutson.com or go to www.amazon.com. Welcome back, folks. Before the break, we were talking about children that feel worthless and how by becoming a good criminal, I proved to myself that I was capable of doing things, which gave me a sense of self-confidence. Didn't make me think I was worth anything, but at least I was confident enough to try things and do things. Denise, what do you think about all that? Oh, I I agree. Uh, I was very much more fortunate um, I mean, I mean, not in some ways because I was made to feel, you know, oh gosh, just as bad as anybody could possibly uh, be. But um, I had uh, a lot of things that I could do. I was interested in art, and uh, I was constantly drawing, and and uh, later on got into painting. But uh, I had a, an aunt that was an artist, and and um, and my she and my parents. I mean, they got me books and things. So I taught myself to draw, to paint, to letter, and I found out, you know, as I worked on it, that I could be quite good at it. Um, it was the same way with uh, with ballet and toe and tap. Uh, it was hard lots of times. So I think. Uh, I remember more so the uh, the tap being very hard. I was like uh, maybe two and a half, three years old, and uh, some of the steps were very difficult. But my dad, uh, I mean, when he was nice, when he was okay, he was wonderful. He was kind of Jekyll and Hyde, and and so I mean, he was a good dancer, and he he taught he would work with me with the steps and everything, and uh, and then I was interested in horses, ponies, horses, and uh, and they uh, made it possible for me to take lessons and different things like that. So I had a lot of things that I became good at uh, and kept my mind occupied and probably kept me out of a lot of trouble. So I was really very fortunate, you know, in that way. So I, I was aware that there were things that I could do and I could do well even though I really didn't feel very good about myself in general. Okay. So, you know, you want to, for those of you that are parents out there, you really don't want to discourage your children from following something that they're actually interested in. You want to, you know, introduce them to all different kinds of things. But don't discourage your son that wants to cook because you're afraid he might turn out to be gay or a fruit or a wuss or something because he likes to cook because probably he doesn't he just likes to cook same thing with me you know i like to build things blow things up and do all that sort of stuff very boy type things but it wasn't for you know it had nothing to do with my sexual preferences as an adult 
you know, it was just something that interested me. And so, you know, don't discourage children. Let them learn how to do something so they can become at least self-confident enough to try to do different things. Because there's nothing worse out there than someone who feels both worthless, useless, and has no self-confidence because they've always been afraid they might fail and they've never really tried anything. So don't do that to them. You know, that's not a good thing. What do you think, Dee? Well, I agree. I uh, I think they should be encouraged in uh, whatever uh, field that they have an interest in uh, because it, it can mean so much to them in their development. Uh, yeah, I would definitely encourage it. Yeah, and, you know, as we get older, we become into all these things. And, you know, a lot of us that uh, people that uh, will take the most advantage of our course, you want to learn how to like yourself. You know, and the way to like yourself is you have to like yourself and you have to respect yourself. You have to, you know, you can like yourself because you live by your true beliefs and you're proud of yourself for that. You can respect yourself because you've learned what you, what you're good at and what you're not good at. And you're good. Everyone is good at something. Everyone has some sort of talent. And once you find something you're good at, you can build self-confidence. You know, I had a boyfriend for a while that one of the smartest people I've ever met and uh, he had a lot of self-confidence because he was very good at what he did he was a chemist and he was very good at what he did but the man had absolutely no sense of self-worth he thought he was totally useless and worthless we ultimately broke up because because of that attitude it it got to the point that he began um, drinking too much and threatening to blow things up and it began getting scary so we broke up but I felt, you know, it was terrible. He was he was a good person otherwise, but he had absolutely no sense of self worth, even though he was had a great deal of self confidence in his field because he knew he was good at what he did. That's probably why he didn't commit suicide or something like that, because he knew he could do things. He just thought he was worthless. What do you think about all that, Dave? Well, I, I think that's an important distinction too, because you can be very good at a lot of things but still feel pretty worthless inside and uh, for me it's been a long journey uh, to uh, to really feel good about myself deep down inside and I still have times you know when when I, I, I'm having problems with it but um, you know I've learned over the years that you know basically I'm pretty good and 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 uh, and, and it's given me confidence that I've never had before. I still have a ways to go, but at the same time, I'm very grateful that, you know, I've had the experiences that I have had, that I've been able to have the um, uh, the books and programs and different things that I've needed uh, become available to me and, and uh, be able to realize that these were things that could help me and I mean, it's just really helped change my life, and and so um, so, and I think we should never give up on ourselves, and and I think that's something that's really helped me more than anything. I am relentless. I've made up my mind that you know I, it, it makes no difference what happened to me in my past. I, I'm I'm totally overcoming that, whatever it takes, and so. Um, and you have with whatever you want to do, uh, whether it's, it's finding yourself or whether it's you know uh, something that you want to do uh, in any other field, you have to be relentless because there's always going to be the challenges. So having that mindset is really important. Okay, uh, well I agree with that. And uh, you know, we I just got told we get, need to go to commercial again. So uh, if you have any comments and want to talk to us, uh, you can leave a voice message. It's uh, 866-451-1451. You can uh, put a comment on our blog or you can text me. It's 732-995-3969. And we will be back in a few. Renaissance woman, trailblazer, maverick. Those are just some of the words to describe to Chandra Poulard. 
owner and CEO of House of Virgo Entertainment, LLC, a woman minority veteran-owned entertainment company based in Washington, D.C. Ms. Poulard served 10 years honorably in the United States Navy and departed from active duty to pursue her dreams of becoming an entertainment mogul. House of Virgo Entertainment offers script writing, producing, directing, DJ services, editing, and more. They cater to businesses, corporations, college students, working professionals, aspiring artists and nonprofit organizations, and employ veterans of the armed forces. Tashandra Poulard is pioneering the way we view media and taking her brand global. Visit her at www.houseofvirgoentertainment.com or call 281-515-3740 and like her on Facebook at House of Virgo Entertainment, LLC. Psychologist, master certified coach, and CEO of the executive and organizational development firm True North Leadership, Dr. Relly Nadler brings his expertise in emotional intelligence to keynotes, consulting, coaching, and training. He is the author of Leader's Playbook and Leading with Emotional Intelligence that lays out tips and tools for effective leadership. Dr. Nadler has designed multi day executive boot camps for high achievers in Fortune 500 companies and has coached CEOs, presidents, and their staff and developed and delivered innovative leadership programs for such organizations as Anheuser-Busch, BMW, MCI, EDS, DreamWorks Animation, the U.S. Navy, and Vanguard Health Systems. To learn more and get your free iPhone app highlighting his tools with videos, leadership keys, visit www.truenorthleadership.com today. Welcome back, folks. Uh, During the break, we were discussing some things, and one of the things I wanted to point out is that, you know, in order to, we all have talents, and one of the things, when you're looking at your true beliefs, one of the things you need to look at is your beliefs about gender, because you'd be surprised what interesting things you have there. You know, I remember asking one guy, he said, well, I don't think anything about gender. I said, really? You have a son and a daughter, right? He said, yeah. I said, well, if your daughter wants to be a race car driver, is that okay with you? He looked at me kind of funny and said, not really. I said, what about your son? He said, oh, yeah, that would be great. So, you see, he had some preferences and things about gender. He just never really thought about them. So we need to look at the different things because they are we are different. We look at things differently. Um, our brains, Our brains are actually physically different. You'll find many women who think more like men and many men who think more like women, and that's also normal. You know, uh, I know one time I mentioned to my son about uh, – he was talking about a mother and a father. He said he had both, both, but they weren't all one person, that I was more interested in the things his fathers were interested in, his friend's fathers. But I interacted with him and treated him like a mother does. My husband was the one who cared whether he ate properly or – you know, whether he had the right clothes so he wouldn't get made fun of at school, you know, and that type of thing mattered more to him, which is what most of his, my son's friend's mothers felt about. But you see, they had what they needed, both of what they needed. And and my experience is women like me who think more like men, we're attracted to the men who think more like women. And I'm not saying they're less of men because they're not, you know. Uh, my husband and I argued about a lot of things, but his manhood was never one that was a question for me. I respected him as a man, and uh, you know, and he respected me as a woman. In that sense, we had a good relationship. Uh, there were other reasons why we broke up. But the thing is you need to find out who you are, what you believe, what you want out of life, what you're good at, you know, so that you can have a happy life. Being happy is being content, you know, and – feeling like you have what you need and that's something that not all of us get and uh, you know and we have to work for it like I said and I said earlier that you know I like to build things and blow things up and do all things like math and science well when I finally straightened myself out and quit using and got you know straight I eventually became an electrical engineer because I like to build things. I like math and science, and I got to blow things up too, and I liked that. And for me, that's been a very – I've been happy in my career. I, st- I, I eventually started teaching, and for me, that has made, given me a life of contentment, and that's what happiness really is, liking and respecting yourself. Dee, any final words? 
No, I think we got to go. Well, we do in a minute, in a minute but uh, any, anything you wanted to add, final comment? Oh, no, I think you pretty well summed it all up. Okay. So, uh, you know, uh, at this point, you know, we're, we're wrapping the show up. We talked about uh, some of the differences between men and women that some are biological. Some are biological. Some things we're hardwired for. Uh, other things are cultural and a matter of choice. Some are, some aren't. But the point is, you need to know who you are, what you believe, what you want out of life. You need to respect yourself. You need to like yourself. You see, what other people think about me is irrelevant to me. The only opinion about me that matters is mine. And, for example, I, if my children didn't respect me, didn't like me, it would break my heart. But it wouldn't affect my self sense of self-worth because it's not – you know, in, it's not related in what other people think. My, I base my self-worth on how well I use my God-given abilities. Do I slack off? Yes, I'm human. Uh, I eventually get back on track, but I'm the only one that can affect my self, self-worth. And uh, I'm the only one that can do that. Nobody else can. And, uh, you know, it's been fun talking to you tonight. I'm hoping that you people are getting better uh we will i will have a a training course available online probably after the first of the year and hope that you can do these things and uh i'm running out of things to say so we're here to help aren't we yes we're here to help and uh so you know again people uh go to my website the living without lies.com we'll get you there and uh, see what we have to say and I look forward to hope you have a good week hope you all have a good Thanksgiving eat too much and pass out from eating so much and that you uh, get to be with your families and hopefully not have too many family fights and uh, you know um, and you know so uh, looking forward to talking to you again next week God bless you've been listening to Living Without Lies with your host Donna Warren Contact Donna at D-L-U-H-R-S at Comcast.net or call 732-995-3969 for information about the Living Without Lies Foundation. You are not alone on the path to building a new life. You've been listening to the BBM Global Network. The ideas, views, and opinions of this broadcast are those of the participants of the program and are not necessarily the ideas, views, and opinions of the BBM Global Network Company.